Hi everyone, uh, my name is Paul. Um, I've got a lot to go through, so we'll kick off. Um, the, um, this is the country that I live in, this is New Zealand. This is in fact the South Island, we've got two islands, we've got the North Island and the South Island, it avoids confusion, we named them that way to so avoid confusion. Um, so uh, this is, I live on the North Island in fact, I work for a company called Fairfax Media and we are um, one of the largest um, media and publishing companies in, in Australia and New Zealand. Um, we are in the newspaper business, um, which I don't know if you've heard is in a bit of bother. Um, things have changed for us quite substantially. So this talk is about us and what we're trying to do to survive um, the, the situation that we're in. Um, and I, I described the situation a bit more. And I, I, it's, a, it's a case study, essentially. I don't have answers. I only have ideas for how we can progress this. So innovate or die trying. Um, uh, can you hear me OK? You're all good? Great. Um, my wife insisted that I put this photo in. I'm sorry. This is me pre-beard. Um, <laughs> kind of beardish, but um, I'm, an, I'm an agile lead at uh, Fairfax in Wellington, um, in Fairfax, New Zealand. Um, so I, we've, we've got agile teams. We, um, I was really pleased to see Mary's talk earlier that we've, we tick a, lot of, tick, a lot, tick a lot of those boxes. We, we're hypothesis driven. Uh, we are working towards continuous delivery. We can always improve. We do a lot of good things and the internal teams um, uh, are set up really well and now we also work with a lot of vendors as well and we, we consider those vendors to be our partners and we try to develop long-term relationships with our vendors we don't want to have this short-term project mentality we want to develop that relationship I've been in the business of software for about 25 years now um, initially a software developer um, about 10 years ago I moved into an agile space after working for a big government project um, which didn't go too well. We, um, we, we failed, we, we didn't fail to deliver. That was, a, that was a horrible thing. We actually delivered on time and on budget. But um, when the customer actually saw what we delivered, they said, it's not what we wanted. Um, which is the worst feeling in the world when you build something for a customer that they don't actually need or want. Um, and it took another six months. So it, that took, it took us 10 months to get to that point and then another six months to rework it into something that was actually usable. Um, and I thought at that point, I, I left, um, took three months off, thought there's got to be a better, way of doing, better, a better way of doing things. I really had had enough and I, I, took, I, I came back in, I got pulled back into several startups. I started up one of my own and then a, um, another startup where we were allowed to do things how we wanted and we took things in an agile way. And to us, agile just meant collaboration with the people we were building things for and regular collaboration like, you know, they were actually part of our team, that kind of thing. Um, so that's my story. I, I, I joined Fairfax a couple of years ago. I, I was looking for a challenge, um, and I think I found one. <coughs> um, most people know who Kodak is, right? I don't think there's anyone young enough in the room to know who Kodak aren't. You know, they, are a, they were a big... Kodak and Fujifilm, you know, they were two big players in the, in the world as far as film was concerned. They, um, you know... Everyone has photos like this. I'm sure you've got stacks of photos like this in your, in your attic somewhere or lying around somewhere or in albums. Um, um, and what people don't realize is, well, one, Kodak went bankrupt in 2012. That's the first thing. But the other amazing thing is they, um, they actually invented a digital camera. They invented a digital camera in 1975. This, this is the first digital camera here. Um, it's got a... This is the inventor, by the way. He was 24 when he invented it. Um, and um, they've actually got a cassette on the side here. This is like a normal audio cassette that we all had, you know, in, the, in those days. And they, it took 23 seconds to download the photograph. Once it was taken, it was a very small CCD. It was all based on CCD technology. Um, one of the first uses and, uh, for camera. And it, well, definitely the first use for camera, sorry. But it was one of the first uses. And um, he took it to the executive, and they looked at it and said, why, no, no one's going to watch. No one's going to want to look at photographs on their TV. Surely, why would anyone want this? Um, and the marketing and executive basically said that, that they weren't going to progress this idea. They also realised what an, an, a huge disruption it was going to be on their business, and they didn't want that disruption. They 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 pretty much owned the entire product line from start to finish, from film to printing, and processing, and so on. Um, and even when the Steve and um, a colleague um, invented the first digital SLR in, um, in 1989, I think it was. Um, 
they got the same reaction from the board. No, they just didn't want to know. They didn't, the technology wasn't, to be fair, the technology probably wasn't in place. They couldn't see that the technology was there to enable this kind of um, um, approach to photography. Um, but they, they still maintained that it would be a huge disruption on their existing business model. And they, they didn't want to disrupt their existing business model. It's really hard to do that, by the way. Really hard, I, I know from experience. Um, so our Kodak moment um, in, the, in the printing or newspaper industry, um, we, we had a very similar experience, and that's why I wanted to put Kodak out there, because it's a very close analogy to what we've done. You know, we, we, we entered the digital market ourselves, and, but we were scared of the digital. Newspaper was making so much money for us. Our revenues were huge um, from advertising primarily, but we just didn't want to challenge that business model. And even though we could s probably see it coming, we still had our heads in the sand. So this is a bit of a history of us in Wellington. We're uh, approximately 150 years old in New Zealand. Um, so printing started um, back in 1865 with the Evening Post. Uh, then uh, a competitor kicked off in 1907, the Dominion. These were bought by Rupert Murdoch's uh, company in 1972. By then there was about 40 or 50 publications um, he, he eventually merged the Evening Post and the Dominion into what we now know as the Dominion Post. It's a morning paper. Um, we went live with our online offering in 2000. Um, Murdoch sold to Fairfax Family in 2003. Um, in the US, at the, in the meantime, advertising revenue was reaching its peak of about $50 billion a year um, for, for, for newspaper. Um, 2007, most of us know that there was a global financial meltdown and advertising revenue went off a cliff. Um, I'll come back to that. And then iOS apps, Android apps, and so on. And by the 2011, advertising revenue had halved in the US to 25 billion. Um, and it wasn't until then that we got our mandate to, to transform into a digital first company. We'd been resisting for that long. The writing had been on the wall for that long, but we still resisted. And it wasn't until 2012 when our, our new CEO came in. He had a digital background. He said, right, what are we doing? This is no longer a print industry. This is a digital industry, and you guys need to transform this business. We still have printing plants, of course. We still, you know, our latest, um, our latest change um, upgrade to our printing plant cost $20 million. Um, we've actually consolidated with, we, we print, um, we share prints, uh, uh, print plant with our major competitor. Um, we share distribution costs with them as well. Um, it, New Zealand's not a big country. I guess you, most of you already know that, but there's only 4 million of us. Um, so uh, distribution is quite high, though. It's about $40 million a year, for example, for print alone. So for, for, you know, it's quite a major task. Um, we then, we've just had recently had a huge success in the sense that we've launched our digital-first um, authoring platform, which means... Uh, Effectively, we've got an operational backbone which uh, enables us to print, uh, sorry, focus on digital um, publication first and foremost, but then allows us to syndicate um, content through to other formats quite easily, and it allows the journalists to be in one application and one um, uh, way of entering their content. And they, they become uh, a, a digital first newsroom. So th this is just a graph it for you to see what happened in 2007. This is, this is well, it reached its peak here in, in, in the US. This is in billions of dollars. Um, and then 2007, 2008, when the meltdown happens, it goes off the cliff. Um, and everybody expected it to come back. But of course, it didn't come back. It just has, has declined further and further. Along the bottom here, the gray line, we've got the digital revenue. And that's, the, that's what we make from digital advertising not significant at all for us, uh, not, not to support the business that we have anyway, or the current business model that we have. And then, of course, the, the middle line is Google and their global revenue. Um, they're currently about $60 billion in global and about $16 billion in the US. So Google, Google and another, other, a number of other social media um, types took advertising away from us, essentially. We also lost other things, other sources of income to, uh, like classifieds, for example, which went to eBay and um, Craigslist and um, locally for us it would be TradeMe. We, we, have a, we don't have eBay in New Zealand as such. TradeMe is the major player. 
and a number of other factors contributed to this. So, digital disruption, the adventure begins. Um, Jean Ross, um, she's based at MIT Sloan, and she has a theory that um, she calls smack it, and she says it sounds, it feels like it sounds smack it. You know, it's, it's social media, mobile, analytics, cloud, and Internet of Things. And she says these have all come together to, at least the confluence of these technologies that's provided the opportunities for disruption in, in this market or in, you know, in any market. Um, there's also things that are followed up behind this, like cognitive computing and um, biometrics, for example. All of these things contribute to um, different ways of delivering or changing the value proposition of something that you already do and enhancing it to make it better. So it's, and it's, it's much easier for someone to, to obviously um, enter our market and compete against us. We, you know, our, our, our printing press costs $100 million plus in one plant. Um, no one could afford to enter our market and compete against us in that situation. People, journalists were tied to a newsroom or a news outlet and they, they had to be, you know, if they wanted to work for the best news outlet, then they had to be the best at what they did. But now that's all gone. The internet's leveled everything for us. You know, and technology is a great leveler. It makes, people, it makes it much cheaper for people to enter and compete against us. The other contributing factor, of course, is Moore's law and um, the fact that, uh, you know, Gordon Moore predicted in 1965 and revised in 1975 that transistor density on integrated circuits would double every two years. Um, and combined with David Hess's observation, he's also Intel, or what was Intel, um, that the increase in speed in, uh, of transistor technology would mean that raw computing power would double every 18 months. Now, hard, to, hard for us to think what that means. That's an exponential growth and that ex exponential, we don't really think easily in exponential terms. Um, it's easy for us to think in linear, so 30 linear steps, 30 meters, um, pretty, uh, pretty easy for us to see where that's taking us. It's going to take us to the end of this basketball court. Um, exponential steps though are harder for us to see. Five exponential steps take us to the end of this basketball court. But if I was to ask you guys how far do you think 30 exponential steps would take us. Anyone, any ideas? It's a long, long way. <coughs> so not just once around the moon, and, but well, around the moon and back again and out to the moon again, or 26 times around the world, it's, it's, it's one billion meters. So exponential is, is, is huge and there's a um, a really interesting guy called Ray Kurzweil, he's, he's at the Singularity Symposium, or you can find him online at Singularity Symposium, and he is one of the guys who predicted the internet back in the 80s, and he, he's basically said that he attributes his able, ability to predict um, the future in terms of technology uh, because he thinks exponentially, or he, he, he tries to extrapolate his thoughts out in exponential terms. So, you know, linear... Isn't, you know, this is not the path we're on. The technology is accelerating and the curve that we're on is accelerating faster and faster as we, you know, we've... To give you an, another example, um, this is the 1985 Cray 2 computer. It's about, it's about half the size of the Cray 1, which was 1975. Uh, that's about approximate real size compared to an iPhone 5, which has 2.7 times the processing power of the Cray 2 and is, is about 1,000 times smaller. You know, we're, for me, growing up with this, the Cray 2 was like the, the, the standard. <laughs> you know, everyone wanted to get near a Cray 2. But now I've got an iPhone 6 in my pocket. What, I don't even know. How, you know, it's at least four times, five times more powerful than that. Um, so Jean, back to Jean Ross at MIT. She says there's really only two ways that we're going to manage digital disruption. Um, and, and she believes there's two, two strategies that you can take, but you can only take one. You can't take both because you're going to confuse the problem if you do. Um, so, and she said, funnily enough, you'd probably end up in the same place if you took one of these strategies. You'd probably, or the other, you'd probably end up in the same place. But you sh um, sh the first one is customer engagement. You focus on how you're going to um, change your value proposition to create a customer experience that no other company can deliver. 
and you're, you're probably going to enhance it with technology, but you're focused on the customer experience and what the customer gets. This, this is example here is um, a company in the Netherlands called Bertzog. They're um, a community care, nursing care organization. They, um, they, they, they wanted to solve a problem, and the problem was a tiered healthcare system where people on the front line were giving healthcare quality or healthcare based on what the person had paid for. So if, they, if they'd only paid for a basic healthcare um, package, they would only get basic healthcare. And that meant a professional, a registered nurse, being on the front line making decisions about what care that she could and couldn't give or he couldn't, couldn't, couldn't give to, uh, to um, somebody in their care, which is, of course, a conflict, a huge conflict of interest for someone who's in the caring profession. <coughs> so they formed small, back, back in 2004, I'm making this, it's the middle, middle 2000, so I think it's 2005, 2006. They formed um, with their a specific um, purpose of offering a, a single tier care, healthcare system. Um, they, they operate in small teams. They, they, they have a maximum of 12 nurses or, or 12 um, caring uh, professionals in each team. They, they organically became agile in the process because they, they have... They have very few managers. No, sorry, strike that. They have no managers. They have 50 back office staff. And they've, they've grown to approximately 12,000 um, carers in their teams now. So they've got, it's a, it's a large organization, very, very little um, back office in comparison, and very self organized. Um, what it does mean is they can deliver healthcare. Um, in the previous system as well, people could see, it, people in care could see up to 40 different people. In the, in the old system, now they get a maximum of 12 people. And of course, that tight-knit group of 12 is able to have some coherency and consistency in their healthcare strategy. Um, the alternative is a digitized solution, and di digital um, offers uh, unique experiences in terms of like um, enhancing um, existing products. Um, some, I think it was Mary yesterday as well who talked about GE, I believe, and the fact that GE have large... They, they've gone through the digital solution approach as well. Um, they, they, they wrap existing large assets in, like turbines and jet engines with um, sophisticated um, data gathering technology, which then feeds that back to someone who can optimize and enhance the performance of that um, large asset. Um, Uber, Uber did a similar thing. They took a market that already existed. They haven't changed it substantially. It was not disruptive as such, but they've they've made the um, uh, they provided a digital solution which makes it much easier and safer to order a, a, a cab um, and go somewhere, go from A to B. That's the job that, that we're trying to solve here. Is what, how do we get from A to B? And Uber have made it um, super smooth as uh, as far as I'm concerned. Anyway, they they they, they it's a much easier. Um, um, much easier uh, experience on than ordering a taxi. So, um, Fairfax, back to Fairfax and our digital strategy and how we're facing disruption. We've we've gone for this approach where um, it's this is this has occurred quite naturally for us, but it seemed like we had to lean out our our um, processes. Um, and we, we've created this concept of the lean newsroom or, or publish, publish ready newsroom. So we're, what we're doing is trying to reduce waste as much as possible and support. We've got 600 journalists in our team in, in New Zealand. So, you know, we've got quite a, we publish 1,200 stories a day. Um, we, we've got quite an operation. And any time that we can save those guys in terms of publication is, is obviously saving costs overall for the company. Um, but, and what we used to do is go through a series of um, sub-editing steps. So... In, in traditional print um, editing or, or journalism, you, um, you, the journalist creates the basic story outline or maybe something quite substantial, but then it goes through, um, the, the, the sub-editor looks at the title and makes sure that the title fits the page, makes, they make sure the copy fits the page and so on. They're, 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 um, there's a whole series of steps which means that the original journalist often has real, really doesn't recognize the final piece of work that's, that's published or printed. We've taken all of that away. Now it's just a single person who's responsible from beginning to end of the publication, including on the print side still, where we have the print side where those stories are going through to print. So um, we've, we've built a software platform. We're 
we, we, we um, feel like we're quite ahead of the game. I'm sure other people are doing similar things in our industry because it just seemed quite natural that we had to do this. Like I said, um, and it, it's what we would call our operational backbone. It's the, it's the, it's the, you know, it's what keeps us alive in terms of like being able to produce content. This is, this is our, is this, this is our critical system, if you like, and this is where we have to have uptime up if we're going to produce. We have to produce content to, to, um, to survive. Uh, this is our newsroom, by the way. We we work in an activity-based working environment, so nobody has a fixed desk. We all come in in the mornings. We've got lockers. Um, we can pretty much uh, work rela related to the activity that we're doing. If we need to work with these guys, we've we've integrated we've integrated our technology teams with the newsroom, and we're in the process of making that a much tighter um, relationship. Uh, we we don't see us as separate anymore. We we actually operate. We'll we'll locate within this space and work with them as close as we can. It's amazing what you learn by osmosis when you're sitting in the environment your, your customer's working in. <clears throat> We've gone down the path of sustaining innovation. Um, every company does. And, you know, if you, someone like Clayton Christian talks, Clay, Clayton, Clayton Christensen from uh, Harvard talks about um, sustaining innovation versus disruptive. Um, most established companies naturally fall into a sustaining innovation model, which is um, what, what I mean by sustaining innovation is we, we seek to enhance the profit, profitability of our existing products by um, going to our more um, uh, involved and sometimes more demanding customers and trying to increase the profit for them uh, around them. So making, making niche products essentially for people who want to pay us for them. Um, So this means that we, we, we're looking to move up into our market, in other words. And we're doing that with a lean startup approach. We, it's, we, we've gone very, like I said earlier, we've gone hypothesis-driven, de, de, um, we, development-driven. So we, we, um, we think about problems that we want to solve. And we, we test out these problems as, as quickly as we can. To, to, well, we test out the solutions that we think might work for these problems as quickly as we can. Um, we encourage... And we encourage um, Metric, a metrics-driven culture. We want, we want to see results. We, you, you measure, sorry, you get what you measure, basically, and so it's really important to think about the measurements. So just to give you some more background information, we're not in a bad position. Considering the population of New Zealand is only 4 million, we've got half the population uh, as an audience, we're not in a bad place. We just have to commercialize our product. We've got content, heaps of content. But the problem is, in, in any innovative kind of endeavor, is how you commercialize. Um, these are the two examples of what we do um, in terms of like validating ideas as quickly as possible. Um, it's a concept called the button to nowhere, which means we haven't fully built the product. It looks like a fully working product on the surface of it. Um, but we're really just getting you to click through to a certain point where we can say, um, for example, you, we, we asked you if you want to log in or maybe register um, for, to, to, because you want to sign up for this product, at which point we present you with a screen which says, sorry, we haven't finished building this out yet, but thank you for your interest. Please enter your email and we will get back to you when we've finished. But we've got some very valuable information at that point which we know people are interested or we can judge the... Um, the scale of the interest in it. Um, the other approach we use is called the Wizard of Oz. Um, so I, I think most of you might be familiar with the Wizard of Oz, but it's basically, um, it looked like the genuine thing, a, a big scary guy who was all powerful. Um, in fact, it was just a guy behind the curtain working a few mechanical bits and pieces. So again, we build something out, but it looks like it's all powerful, but in fact, it's, um, it's mechanical in nature or manual in nature behind it. We're just looking for feedback as quickly as we can. The other approaches, of course, are things like A-B testing and so on. Um, we're just, we're just lying, we just want to learn as much about an idea before we commit to developing it out. The third sort of step to our strategy is um, taking an integrated approach. This is really trying to say, stop these silos. We don't need silos. We're a digital company. Every digital is now everybody's responsibility. It's not an IT thing. IT, and I, we, I, sh, I, sh, I shudder every time I hear the word IT because I've worked in IT departments. Um, we, this is a whole organization responsibility, and we need to start thinking like that. It's not one 
it's not one um, silo that's responsible for this. Um, the important thing with this, though, is that we, we like to maintain something. There's this concept of the church and the state in, in the newsroom, which means you want to separate those two out. You don't want the newsroom to be biased by the commercial, um, because then you get things like sponsored content and native advertising, which starts to, it, it, it suckers you guys as the audience into something that looks like a journalistic piece, but is in fact a, uh, um, it's an advert. <coughs> Uh, uh, you know, uh, maybe informative advert, but it's an advert. Um, so we we are, you know, even though people, heaps of people are experimenting, like the Guardian, the New York Times, um, with that approach, we are well aware that we um, we shouldn't be messing with our audience in that way, and we need to find alternatives to commercialise things out. So we we do separate that con that idea of the newsroom and the commercial, and the way we do that is by focusing our internal teams on the newsroom and our external partners on the commercial. <coughs> the content and curation and discovery is at the heart of this for us because that's why a lot of people come to us for the news. They could get the news many other places. Hopefully they come to us because they're like-minded and they like the content that we're providing. They like what we're reporting. Um, it's very much like, um, I'll talk to you later about the analogy I've got. So um, Clayton Christensen from Harvard he said the important thing you have to do at this, in this position is think what's the job that you're trying to, you know, what's the job that your customer or audience is coming to do when they're on your, using your product. And he states it quite clearly. People don't want to buy a quarter inch drill. They want a quarter inch hole. Um, you know, just in the same way that um, when you hire a Uber, you don't want a car, you want an A to B um, journey. You know, you, you, don't, you don't want to be a car owner. So, we have to. Th we, we've started shaping our thought processes around what is the job that we're trying to. What is the job that the person is trying to do when they're on our on our site? And a lot of that stuff for us is looking at content discovery. Um, in terms of um, people, they want to find content easily. They don't want to search. They don't want great. Um, they, they they don't want to have um, to work to find the things they're looking for. Fourth step for us is to become a modern broadcaster. Uh, so we're diversi into, diversifying into multiple channels. Um, we, we're uh, going through um, talks to merge with a, um, a competitor at the moment in New Zealand, and no longer a competitor, but seen as an ally. We, we actually share printing presses with them already. Uh, and now we're looking to acquire, well, merge each other into this. this um, they, they, will, they will provide radio for us. Um, we will provide internet and, um, and newspaper. Uh, across the country. Um, and this is just some of the things that we're exploring in terms of other alternative revenue streams. Neighbourly is, um, this one over here is a, a community-based um, uh, website which allows people to sign up and um, look at uh, the they, they get news and information in, in a hyper-local sense. You know, it's, this is my community, this is my this is, this is my friend group and social group on, in that community. It puts them in touch with their neighbours, essentially, and also um, events and news that um, relate to their local or their locality. Um, Stuff Nation is a, um, is a uh, what we call user-generated content. It's, it sounds quite um, sterile, but it's uh, people blogging on our site for us. So it's uh, curated content in the sense that they, but they're, they are, they're blogging. Um, and the fifth thing for us to do is perform some organizational surgery. This is something that Jean talks about a lot, is that we, uh, I've talked already about maintaining the separation of church and state, but, um, and we view editorial as the audience draw card and commercial as the way of, of making money, but we really need to just chop out the silos and think of, us, think of ourselves as one big organization that, well, whatever size the organization needs to be to support the business model that we're trying to create. So th that's what we're currently doing. That, that's our approach at the moment. We, we also realize that this thing called disruptive innovation, which Clayton Christensen talks about, is something that we have to be fully aware of. Because what, disruptive innovation, what Clayton means by disruptive innovation is when, someone, when a technology enables somebody to come in and undercut your market in a, and do something in a cheaper way than you can already do it. And essentially what they're doing is taking out your... They, they, they're either coming in underneath you and taking your um, 
customer that isn't feeling so loved because you're not focused. You're, focus, you're focusing your sustaining innovation up here on your profitable customers, and your low, your, your low profit customers are basically ignored. And those, that, that means somebody can come in and take that customer from you using a cheaper or, or better technology approach. Um, they're, they're also, it's also possible for them to come in from an adjacent market. Um, and let, adjacent markets in our, in our, in our um, environment would be something like social media. That was an adjacent market. It, no one really s saw how much that would take the news away from us or news feeds away from us. This is the only video store that's left in my city. Um, I thought I'd put this up here because this is, the, this is something that we need to think about. These guys are essentially, the reason they've survived is related to the curated content. Um, they nearly went under, they nearly closed, but um, it, uh, the, the community rallied around them and um, they, they, they're a bunch of movie um, nerds. They love movies. I've, I've, been in, I've been in multiple quizzes with these guys at you know, movie quiz nights. I, we've never ever beaten them. We're always second to the guys from Arrow Street Video. They, um, they know a lot about their stuff. You walk into the shop and you can say, oh, I've seen these films and this, and I like these directors, and, I've, I've, you know, and they will recommend something to you. And then they're usually always right. They're always spot on in terms of this and their recommendations, which is why they've survived. They, they, and you know, it's a similar situation with bookstores in our, in, you know, a, a lot of what we would call bookstores back in the day, or you know, maybe five, ten years ago, and now what we see is stationery shops. We would buy our stationery from them, but we'd never go in there to buy a book from them anymore. But we still have those books that stores that curate content, and they will, they know, they know their stuff, and you'll go in there because you want a recommendation. And so for us, that's where our disruptive thinking is happening at the moment. We need to start really innovating around this. But of course, the problem with innovation, well, as some, someone suggested, you know, that these, these guys, um, when they were under threat of going under their, their collection, was so um, important. Someone suggested putting it in a museum. And that really is the writing on the wall for these guys that they need to, they need to change their business model quickly and, and maybe find a better way of recommending um, movies to watch that they can commercialize in the same way we have to find a way of commercializing commercializing our content because pretty much that content is available in multiple sources but it's the we, we, we believe it's the recommendation that will will get us the money or the the audience at least so just some things that are on our radar and um, this is our home page over here um, we probably won't have a home page soon. Virtually nobody goes there anymore. They all come directly from uh, Facebook or Twitter. They're, they're all linked in from somewhere else. They're going directly to an article page. They go directly to a landing page. They don't see our section pages. We're, we're going to a distributed content model. Um, so we, we have the home page and we have, an adapt we have a, a, um, a fairly good looking adaptive home page as well, but we just don't see a future for it at the moment. The, um, the other aspect of that, of course, is that social media has created a, um, a, a, a news, um, news of its own, if you like. You, know, you, 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 you have a group of people that you trust to feed you uh, relevant or um, uh, trustworthy information, and that, that you know, becomes a truth for you, that, that information is, you, know, you, you see that as news. And an example, this is a Guardian article. Um, how technology disrupted the truth. This was talking about the British Prime Minister and the fact that the Daily Mail started reporting based on social media that the Prime Minister had committed an obscene act with a pig's head. Um, it just wasn't true, or no, there's no proof out there that it actually happened, but social media made it a truth. And The Guardian you know, is saying, well, is this, is this, valid, is this valid news? You know, is this, what's, what's happening in this, in this regard? But, you know, that's that's a problem for us to deal with, I think, and I, I, don't, I don't know how we're going to solve that problem. We, we have other things to consider on our radar. We've got the Internet of Things. We don't know how that's going to affect us. Um, and then we've got um, Watson over here and other cognitive computing kind of um, approaches that might take away, you know, they, they might be a, Watson might be a perfectly good curator of the news for someone. Um, So what can we learn? I, I, I think these are, my take, these are my takeaways for you is that digital disruption is only going to accelerate. Organizations should consider restructuring to adapt to the rate of change that's going you know, that, to that's, that's happen. 
lean startup experiments or something like that are only going to help. Um, you need to separate um, maybe an R&D department to look at uh, new revenue streams. So, and, and the reason you need to separate your R&D department out is because you can't disrupt yourself. Just like Kodak couldn't disrupt themselves with their digital camera, you will, it's just not in an established organization um, DNA to disrupt its own business model. So the approach that's suggested is that you take um, maybe a small team and a skunk works type operation and then you, you, you spin them off in, in a separate organization. Maybe they report into a board member, but they, they essentially have a separate budget and they're a separate entity for all purposes because they will be the people that will be um, building the commercial future for you, if you like, or alternative commercial, commercial futures. It's a bit like um, the, um, um, you know, the approach where you think the conformity bias, I think it was, is where you're saying, well, we all believe that this is what's going to play out and this is how it's going um, how, how to happen, and that might be the majority rules, but your R&D department is the one looking at the alternatives and the, you know, the minority approach to really seriously how we might be disrupted in the future and disrupting our own business model. I put this slide up. This, is, this source is from um, Russell Reynolds Associates. This, these are percent ex the percent of executives who responded that their business will be moderately or massively disrupted by digital in the future. Media is up there. But, you know, there's other... It's, it's happening across the board. And I, I don't really want to be a harbinger of doom for you guys, but you need to think about this. It's digital. You need to think about your digital first strategy. It will come to you. you, you it will affect everybody. Um, this rate of change with technology is, is, is not going to go away. It's only going to accelerate. So three things to think about is will you focus on customer experience or a digitalized solution? How will you sustain your current approach? How will you face digital disruption in your market? And that's all from me. Uh, I think we've got plenty of time for questions, so please. Android app, yep. And 2012, uh, you say there's a new CEO coming in and throughout the digital yep. strategy. So I want to know more detail about what happened before 2012 because I see that the I can consider the iOS and Android yep. some sort of digital but uh, I'm not sure whether it's really the strategy you are mentioning just now. No, and that, that, those apps happened, really it was a rogue product manager who uh, decided to spin up his own team and start creating the apps, much to the chagrin of the newsroom who didn't want it at the time, but they, because um, they didn't, they saw it as distracting. So we, one, they saw the website as taking away business from the paper business, and then when, and then they saw the Android and uh, other mobile apps taking away business from the digital, uh, the, the website. So it all got really, it was really, really confused. And the, the, so they, um, what happened was they still had their heads in the sand. They were still trying to ignore the digital thing. We, we were in the position in New Zealand where we were actually a couple of years behind the rest of the world. And I, I don't know if that's literally, but, but we, we, things seem to happen. Um, we, we get warning that things are happening. And I, don't, I just don't think the message had got through that, the, that we needed to become a digital first organization until the, you know, it was clear that companies in the, you know, media companies in the UK and so on were seriously disrupted. There's, there's companies like The Independent in the UK who've gone completely online. They have no more. They don't, they don't print anymore. They don't have a, enough numbers to print and so on. So I don't know, does that answer your question? That's a lot. But basically, heads in the sand, Rogue Product Manager built the apps anyway, but it wasn't until 2012 when we actually had a strategy around digital. That they needed to, sorry? I think um, it's a good question. 
I'm not sure if I know the exact catalyst, but it was definitely that we got a new CEO who'd been in a, in a, he's, from a he, he's got a technology background. And I just think he just, he, he just took the bull by the horns and said, this has got to change. The, the, you know, and like, uh, uh, that, that was it, I think. That's essentially the, the, as much as I know of the story. Yeah, we do. So we use um, uh, we 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 use the Adobe platform for um, uh, we we use the Adobe platform for content management, and they they've got a great um, experience manager which allows us to gather uh, uh, analytics, and we we've got some great insights people at, to tell us a, a, um, you know uh, basically we're looking at different strategies around our analytics gathering that we can target new markets, basically. Uh, it's more the, uh, the one of the solutions that you mentioned, those spin-offs that they can be used, especially mm. for IP, yep. uh, to, to face disruption. Are you going to have any cases of uh, the people that are doing this, and maybe it's a uh, successful project? Um, the, the one example, well, there's a few examples of companies doing this, but um, there's uh, the one I've got clear, sort of, uh, or clear sight of was one that Clayton Christensen talked about, which was a, the first online bank, uh, online trading bank. Sorry, they um, they they had this idea for online trading, but they realised it was seriously going to undercut their business. So, for example, if you wanted to trade in those days, you had to telephone a broker, and it cost you eighty dollars to do the transaction. Um, but they realized that online trading would be significantly cheaper and that people would be self-serving around that, but it would totally d disrupt their existing model. So what they did was they, they took it, they basically looked for um, a volunteer group to take this idea forward. They, they took them out of the building one day and marched them across to another building and they set up a, their online um, trading um, brokerage. And then they um, basically, the, that company got so large and um, Profitable that they consumed the, uh, the the other trading bank. Uh, questions? Cool. Thanks very much, everybody.